Hello. Today we're going to look at particle interactions and we're going to also cover quantum electrodynamics and quantum chromodynamics. We won't have much time to cover them in detail, but the idea is to give you the essence of what this is all about. So let's go back to basics. We know that if you have two positively charged particles, then they will repel. On the other hand, if you have two unlike particles, they will attract. That's often covered by the phrase The actual force of attraction is given by the Coulomb law, which is simply that F, which is the force, is equal to Q1 Q2 over 4 pi epsilon naught r squared, where Q1 and Q2 are the sizes of the charges in coulombs, and r is the distance between them. And you can see that that force falls off as r increases. But the question for us is, what is causing that force? There must be something that is making those two particles aware of one another's presence and causing them either to attract or repel. And that's where quantum electrodynamics comes in. But before we get into that, we must study Feynman diagrams, which are a very useful device for helping us understand these things. Feynman diagrams were invented by the famous physicist Richard Feynman, and in a simple picture, they describe what it would take a lot of words to do. The rules of Feynman diagrams are quite simple. The time is always going upwards. So you start at the bottom and you work your way up. Particles coming in are shown here. Particles going out are shown here. And the interaction between them is shown here. We follow the convention that particles are shown by solid lines, whereas bosons are shown by wiggly lines. What's the difference between the two? Well, that's really covered in my video on the standard model. But just to remind you that all the elementary particles that we are aware of can be put into this table. There are six quarks, the up quark and the down quark, the charm quark and the strange quark, the top quark and the bottom quark. Then the leptons, which are the electron side of the family, go into these six boxes, the electron, the muon and the tau, and then the electron neutrino, the mu neutrino, and the tau neutrino. And all of those are particles, the quarks and the leptons. These boxes here are for what are called the gauge bosons. They're the force carriers. They're the things that are going to exchange information so that forces can happen. And there are four types. There's the photon, the gluon, the Z boson, and the W plus and the W minus bosons. So now we can go back to our Feynman diagrams where there's one further thing we need to understand and that is that you can have pair creation or pair annihilation. That is to say matter and antimatter can come together and annihilate to form no particles at all, just energy. Or from energy you can create a matter and antimatter pair. Well, now we're ready to have a look and see how this helps to understand the force between two charged particles. As far as the Feynman diagram is concerned, we have an electron coming in and an electron going out, and another electron coming in and going out. But the force which either attracts or repels them is carried by a virtual photon. That is the force carrier. It's also called a gauge boson. We can use Feynman diagrams to understand other interactions. Take, for example, the interaction that is going on all the time in the sun. Protons are being converted into neutrons. This has to happen so that by various means, two protons and two neutrons can come together and form a helium nuclei and thereby release huge amounts of energy. We would normally write that as a proton becomes a neutron plus a positron plus a neutrino. 
A positron is simply the antimatter version of the electron. And positrons do not last very long because as soon as they bump into electrons, they annihilate and produce energy. So you might think that the Feynman diagram for this process is that a proton comes in and then three particles, a neutron, a positron and a neutrino, are emitted. But actually, that's not quite right. What really happens is that a proton comes in and a neutron goes out and a W plus boson is emitted. But that W plus boson doesn't last very long before it decays into a positron and a neutrino. So what in fact is happening is that the proton is converting into a neutron by the emission of a W plus boson, which subsequently decays. We can look at a similar process, the process by which a neutron changes into a proton. In this case, the neutron becomes a proton by the emission of a W minus boson. That then decays into an electron and an antineutrino. This gives rise to the concept in the quantum mechanical world that anything that can happen does happen provided that the baryon number is conserved. Baryons are things like neutrons and protons. The lepton number is conserved, that's electrons, and that charge is conserved. So for example, we can have a situation where a proton and an electron meet together to become a neutron and a neutrino by the exchange of a W plus boson. And now you can see that the baryon number is conserved because a proton comes in and a neutron goes out. The lepton number is conserved because an electron goes in and a neutrino comes out. And charge is conserved because we have a neutron and a neutrino coming out and neither of those have charge. And the proton is positively charged, the electron is negatively charged and the two together essentially neutralize one another. So charge is conserved. But let's look more closely at the process that happens when a proton changes into a neutron. The Feynman diagram shows that a proton comes in and a neutron comes out with the emission of a W plus boson, which decays into a positron and a neutrino.